Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Camille held my daughter's hand tightly and told her, in a low voice, Emily, honey, tomorrow is a day off in the garden and I have to go to work for a few hours. You'll be alone. Emily sighed. Sometimes she had to sit alone. It was kind of uncomfortable at first. Boring lonely and sometimes scary. And then Emily started playing kindergarten. Only the pupil was not her, but her dolls. Sometimes the girl got so into the role that she did not even notice the arrival of her mother. But in such a pastime was one major drawback. She built a whole day at a time. And she had to clean up all at once. That was the only thing that marred the girl. Actually, she was an adult. She went to kindergarten for the last year. It was the end of winter, then spring, summer, and off to school. It was all very exciting. And she and her mother often talked about school. Mom talked about how she was going to first grade. Emily listened with bated breath. After mom's stories, it was not so scary. And Emily slowly began to prepare her dolls for school. They teach them in kindergarten. So far it wasn't working very well because Emily didn't understand how everything was going, but the game was getting more and more exciting. Okay, mom, of course I will. I bought notebooks for your students. Why do you teach them only in words? You'll show them how to write the letters correctly. Remember, I brought you a copybook. So you write there and the dolls in your notebooks. Camille slyly looked at her daughter, more than anything else in the world. Emily didn't like to write. Doing all those little hooks and circles was a punishment for her. She looked at her mother doubtfully. She knew there was a catch, but what was it? Her mother was looking ahead, and Emily thought she was wrong. Thank you, mother. Tomorrow I will teach them all to write. Camille could barely hide her smile. What a strict one you have. Emily laughed happily mom, and there are the girls walking. Can I go out of the yard a little bit, so that you can see me from the window? Camille laughed, not a child, but gold. Just don't be too long, or it'll be dark soon. Camille, of course, overreacted. Everyone in their neighborhood knew each other. In the evenings, despite the rain and the snow, there were always old ladies sitting in the yard. If any of the kids took a step off the playground, they would be caught immediately. He would be given a lecture, and the parents as well. Everybody knew that. Everyone relied on each other. If there was a child on the playground and the old ladies parted, the latter would always shout for the children to come and get them, or Camille would come and get Emily. Let's go. That's how we lived. Camille remembered herself as a little girl. Some old ladies stayed in the yard, some were gone, but new ones came. And then someone would yell out, Evelyn, Camille, take it away, we're leaving. Nothing had changed, almost nothing except that then Camille was a happy child of loving parents. Now she's a single mother, dragging everything on her own, with no one dear soul by her side. There's an aunt, her father's sister. So she lives a thousand kilometers away, calls on holidays, sighs, pities her, and at. Stephen birthday sends a small remittance not so much, but they are always happy, thankful. It is customary in their family, no matter how hard things are at the time. The money is only spent on the gift. Then they call my aunt and tell her what they bought my sweet babies. I never get to see you. I guess that's how fate has scattered us. Camille's aunt had seen her once in her life. She did not know the details, but she knew that her father and her aunt had quarreled, quarreled so badly that they had gone to different cities. As soon as they could, they never spoke to each other because of their age. My aunt came only for the funeral. She wept at the coffin for a long time. What kind of fools are we? We had such a fight over a trifle, and no one tried to make up, and now it's too late. Forgive me, brother. Will we ever meet again? My aunt was with Camille for three days, and to be honest, she wasn't around. Is it a joke to lose your whole family at once? Before she left, Jenna said I understand, Camille, you're an adult, but it's probably better to have someone close by. So if you're thinking about it, you should move in with us. We'll help in any way we can. Camille shook her head. Thank you, Aunt Jenna. It's better to start here, where I know everything, I know everything. The woman nodded. I knew you'd say that. You are very much like your father in character. I look at you and I see him. Well then, shall we say goodbye?
come and visit. I can't do it myself. This trip is hard for me. Camille understood. Aunt Jenna had bad legs. It was as if they were swollen. She could hardly move around, leaning on a cane. Camille walked her to the train station. They cried some more. And for more than 10 years now, all they did was talk on the phone. Emily ran to her girlfriends and Camille walked up to the entryway. Hello. The old ladies perked up. Hello, Camille. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. And you from work? Oh, go on, get some rest. Keep an eye on your little girl. Oh, thank you very much. She smiled again and went into the doorway. It's nice to have that kind of supervision in the yard. Nothing ever goes unnoticed. And when he is so caring, it makes life so much easier for mothers with children. How many times has Camille seen young mothers leave their grandmother's strollers to run to the store or the drugstore? Camille went into the kitchen, put the groceries out of the bags, and started to make dinner. Every now and then she looked out the window too. Emily and her friends were building a snowman. Very soon spring will come. And again her birthday, which deprived her of her parents. Emily froze with a potato in her hands. So many years had passed, and she still remembered how yesterday she had turned 18. She didn't know that her parents had spent a year saving up to throw her a grand birthday party. That day she woke up in the morning and found a small box on the table by her bed. Camille sat up sharply and took the box. She was so afraid to open it. What if it wasn't what she had been dreaming of? Cautiously she opened it, peeked, and squealed. There were beautiful gold earrings. She had looked at them for so long, but realized that they cost so much that their family simply cannot afford it. She had small, almost childish, but so paltry that they were not visible. These she noticed a long time ago. Fortunately, the way from the technical school passed by a jewelry store. Every morning sales girls put on display at the window of what beauty there was not. But these earrings were something special, straight as narrow plates and studded with stones at the bottom. Camille found out later that these stones were not precious. And if they were real, these earrings would have cost a hundred times more. Mom and Dad came into the room. Daughter, we congratulate you on your coming of age. She stormed out of bed in a whirlwind. Mommy, Daddy? Oh, thank you. Do you have any idea how happy I am? Daddy grinned into his mustache. That's not all. The main surprise was ahead of us. At four o'clock her mother and father took her to a restaurant. And all her friends, classmates, and classmates were there. And no one said a word to her that they were invited to a birthday party. Camille was so shocked that she even forgot to smile. The presents, the toasts. It was the best, coolest day of her life. In the middle of the evening her mother came up to her. Honey, you guys go out, and we'll go home. We're not so young after all. Mom, why don't we stay? Camille, have fun, you're an adult now, and nobody's going to give you a party for nothing. So go out, and frankly, we want to lie down now. Mom laughed, kissed her daughter on the nose, and they left. It was only 15 minutes to get home, since Camille's father didn't drink. The parents were in their car, it must have been an hour. You Camille, there was silence at the table. Aya, your parents were in a car accident, both dead. We need you to go to a lineup. That's the last thing Camille heard. She was immediately swallowed up in darkness. A snowball slammed loudly through the window. Camille twitched. Something made her quite think, and dinner wouldn't cook itself. The woman only had time to turn off the gas. As the door slammed, Mom, come help me take off my jacket. Camille sighed. It was the only time Emily spoke like that when she was turning into a snowman. She stepped out into the hallway. God, there was a snowdrift standing and smiling instead of Emily. Apparently, it was freezing by nightfall and all the sticky snow was stuck to the girl's clothes. Not mom, that's just me in the snow a little bit. Camille couldn't help smiling. Sometimes her daughter, without realizing it herself, said such witty jokes that she could bring Camille to tears with laughter. And there was no sense in swearing. Everyone was like that. Camille remembered. She was about eight years old, and they were sneaking off, of course, from their parents, riding down the mountain on the hood of a car. Camille was soaking wet and covered in snow, and she was offended. 
She leaned against the iron fence and stood so offended. No one was in any particular hurry to make peace with her, and she had to stand there for a long time. When everyone started to go away, and it was close to nightfall, Camille decided to go home too, but it wasn't to be. Her coat was frozen to the fence and no one was going to let Camille go. There was no one left on the playground. If only she'd been in the yard. It was behind the house where the old lady's eyes could not see it. Camille had no choice but to slip out of her coat and skip home. Mom almost had a heart attack. When she saw her daughter like that, the woman clutched her chest and barely heard her ask what happened. Daughter, Camille grimly said coat stuck. How everyone laughed afterwards and Camille herself still smiles, remembering that day. Let me help you grief, you're mine. We had to hurry, because Emily was starting to drip. Camille tossed all her outerwear, her daughter's, into the tub to let it melt, and then she'd see what to do with it. Just dry it or wash it. And Emily said if you walk like that, then the rest of the winter jacket will turn into rags, and you have to go to school in such a way. Emily snorted angrily but then said I'll change, right? I won't do that. The girl could not find the right word. Finally, it hit her. To cling. Camille laughed. Oh, I can't with you. Every word is a masterpiece. Sit down for supper. My joy Emily was a passionate person, and she really had the right word for it. If Emily was interested in anything, she was fascinated. Camille always held her hand tightly in the street, because the girl could just stop at something that interested her and get lost. It had happened before. Of course, Emily was not lost, but such stops were not uncommon. It was a good thing that Camille knew about it and always kept a close eye on her. Emily ate with appetite and emotion. However, dinner was a little delayed, because Emily was also telling her about the competition she had with the girls from the neighboring yard. Can you imagine, Mom? They came to our yard and said they would make a better snowman in our yard from our snow. Camille was washing the dishes and smiling at Emily. Well, we don't have to share the snow either. Why do they say that? And who had the better one in the end? The snowmen? Mom, well, of course we did. Although they say that they almost had a fight with us at first. And then we made up and decided that they were both good. How did yours win then? Emily sighed as the girls from the next yard left. We thought about it some more, and then we gave ours the win. Emily looked at her mother triumphantly. Camille tried to choose her words, but this isn't right. The decision was made by everyone, and then you changed it. I know, Mom, that's why we agreed not to tell anyone. Emily stopped chewing. She looked at her mother in horror. Mom, you won't tell anyone. I swear to no one. The girl sighed in relief. Can I go to bed? Are you tired? Very tired, of course. Go brush your teeth. I'll make your bed. An hour later, Camille came to bed. She went to bed, but she couldn't sleep. After the funeral, the investigator called her in. He hid his eyes and kept apologizing. Then apparently he got over himself and said, What kind of person wants to talk to you? The one who caused the accident. Emily tensed up. She knew that a large foreign car had crashed into her parents' car and the driver of the foreign car turned out to be drunk. Why? I don't want to talk to him. I'd still ask you to do it. It wouldn't cost you anything. Five minutes just to listen to him. Emily didn't want to do it, but that's what the investigator asked. I guess a person needs to speak out and ask forgiveness to make himself feel better. But what Emily heard shocked her. A man of about 50 years of age said, in a rather rude way, I offer you money and you forget everything that happened. She was confused at first, then asked back, which sorry, she had gone deaf. The man grimaced, as if Camille were interfering with his life. How much money do you need, so that you don't think of this accident anywhere, ever? Camille put her head down as much as it would take to get her parents back. The man drummed his fingers on the table. You can't bring them back. And you could give me a pretty bad reputation, you know. You have a reputation. I never would have guessed that. The man looked at her angrily, walking and looking around. Camille was so angry that she went to the chief of police and told him everything. He was silent for a while, then he said, I understand your indignation, but I want you to listen to me. I've been working here for a long time, and I know very well that money can do a lot of things here too. 
It didn't used to be like that. It used to be that the honor of the uniform was the honor. Why don't I fight? First of all, I have two years left. And secondly, if something goes wrong, it is the boss's fault. That person who is to blame for your parents' death has someone higher up than all of us put together. Even if you say no, write hundreds of statements. They'll let him go anyway. But you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. I know Noah well. There's nothing sacred about that man, believe me. I'd only advise you from experience not to ruin your life. He's very vindictive. You have no idea how much Camille has cried already. I can't believe you ruined my parents. And I have to walk around looking over my shoulder. The warden threw up his hands. That's the way life is now, my child. Camille decided that she will not forgive and will not settle. Well, it can't be that bad. As it turned out, it could. At the trial, her dead father turned out to be drunk. And he had broken the rules, too. Noah looked at her with contempt. Camille ran out into the street. Tears were flowing in a hailstorm. She thought only of one thing, getting home as soon as possible, so as not to see the hateful faces of people. She did not go out for almost a week. Then, after all, the refrigerator was empty. Did she have to do something about her studies or her job? She didn't know yet. But one thing she knew for sure, someday her life would change so much that she would be able to punish this Noah Camille as an honor student allowed to skip classes. Watch it with me. If anyone finds out, I'll have my head taken off if you mess up your exams and credits too. She sat in front of the principal and smiled. He only looked very threatening, but was actually a very kind and good man. Did you find a job? Not yet, but I'm going to start today. She will. I envy your naked. Who needs you at 19 and under with no education? Sit in the hallway. I'll call some people I know. Thank you, Camille's out in the hallway. What a kind principal they have, huh? He called her 10 minutes later. Here's the address, nine o'clock tomorrow. You can't be late. Someone I know needs a secretary. Thank you very much. Camille couldn't resist kissing the director on the cheek. He was embarrassed. Go already. Camille worked for that acquaintance for three whole years until she went on maternity leave. And then, when Emily was old enough for her to come back, he offered her a completely different position, a more solid one as it were. She now worked in the land department of a construction firm. The work was interesting. She especially liked going out and assessing plots. She never once made a mistake. In addition, she made excellent recommendations to advertise those plots that had been on the market for a long time, and they flew off like hotcakes. The boss, of course, noticed and praised Camille. Not only did she enjoy her work, but also her schedule. She always made it to kindergarten in time. No late nights. True, sometimes she had to work on her day off when clients couldn't or wouldn't free up a weekday. She didn't notice how she fell asleep. She seemed to just close her eyes and already the alarm clock was going off. Camille quickly turned it off and looked at her daughter, who was asleep on her bed. No, she hadn't even moved. But there was nothing surprising about that. When Emily fell asleep you could have rung the bells. She wouldn't have woken up anyway. Camille quietly went out, washed her face, drank her coffee, put food on the table for Emily's daughter knew how to use the microwave. And she was not allowed to touch the gas. Camille looked once more into the room, asleep, and went to work with peace of mind. A neighbor had the keys to the apartment. If Camille stayed longer than she planned, she would call her and she would go check on the girl. Today it worked out even faster than Camille had planned. Both the buyer and the seller were pleased with Camille's work. So immediately on the spot they gave her a bonus for promptness, for counting correctly, and for the day off. Camille was glad. In fact, she wasn't exactly earning badly better than many people in this town. But Camille always tried to dress well, clothe her daughter, and the apartment food often took more than her salary. In addition, there were unforeseen expenses. For example, a dripping faucet in the bathroom. How much longer it will last, it is unclear. Camille ran to the store, bought a cake and headed home. She opened the door and walked in. Strange. No one meets her. Kitten, I'm home. Emily came out of the room. Cheeks, red lips, pale Camille almost dropped the cake. Are you sick? She rushed to the girl. I am. She's burning up like a fire. 
Come on, quick, quick, to bed. But Emily didn't go to bed. She went to sit on the couch in front of the TV. I guess that's where she was waiting for her mom. Touching by the plaid she wrapped herself in, Camille ran into the kitchen, grabbed a thermometer, and returned to her daughter. Three minutes later, she looked up. Jesus. 396. Again, she ran to the kitchen, the first aid kit, and back to her daughter. Left the poor child alone. What kind of mother is she after that? Emily was rarely sick, but she liked being sick terribly. Her mother runs around, fussing over everything Emily wants, buying her everything. Only one thing made Emily sad. When you're sick, you don't want anything. You don't want to try all the ice cream or some unexplored fruit. When the girl recovered, she sighed with regret. She had to write a list of things she should ask for next time. Of course, she forgot when the medicine began to work. Emily began to fall asleep. Camille gently tucked her in, pushing the plaid to sleep for a while. Tomorrow will be easier. Emily closed her eyes and Camille sighed. Tomorrow will be easier. Tonight would be a fun night. Emily had been sick for no more than three days. The first day she had such a fever that she had to call an ambulance. But that was before. Now Camille is doing fine on her own. Then for two more days, there was some kind of a weak cold. On the fourth day, the child wakes up with a great appetite. Such a peculiarity in her father. She remembered to her misfortune. Camille was even angry with herself because she categorically did not want to remember Emily's father. But sometimes she even dreamed about him. She woke up in tears, then could not sleep for a long time. No one knew what had made them part. No one knew where John was now. Camille took another look at her daughter, how much she looked like him. Smart, slender face, as if John had been painted as a girl. Camille had never seen such a strong resemblance to her father's. She looked like her father too. But one only noticed it when daddy and her were around. And here, here, if anyone knew John, when they saw Emily, they would say they were related. While Emily slept, Camille made morsels. Then she thought about it and decided to bake a charlotte. Emily was very fond of this simple pie. She would eat it for sure. Will refuse, maybe at least a slice of charlotte will do. The cake went safely into the refrigerator, then they would get to it. And Camille began to make the dough. The doorbell rang. Camille went to open it, or rather she ran. Who was it? Standing on the doorstep was Wendy, Wendy. Emily's best friend and godmother. And I didn't understand why my goddaughter wasn't meeting me. Wendy got married three years ago, and she and her husband decided to move to the country. At the time, many people laughed at their decision. Frankly, neither could Camille imagine Wendy, who always had painted nails, manicured eyelashes and all, in a country setting. But Wendy was adamant. We'll prove to you yet, how can you live in the country? She sold the apartment she had inherited from her grandmother. And to the lamentations of her parents, she left for some village. The first year, there was almost no news from them. The second year, Wendy showed up. Camille looked at her with her mouth hanging open. And nothing, in principle, has changed. Long nails, eyelashes. Wendy, how did she laugh? Oh, I cannot with you. You sit in your town, do not see anything. And in the village, by the way, in our non-ecological time can build a good business. And Wendy and her husband built it. And what a great one. An entire empire in a very short time. With the money she got for the apartment, they bought a house, a large plot of land, hired workers, bought some special livestock, and started doing business. Now Wendy had such fur coats had such a car that all her city girlfriends were just biting their elbows. Wendy, am I glad to see you. Come in, your goddaughter just fell asleep with a fever, but I'm still waiting for her to catch a cold tonight. It's the end of winter, when did she have time? Exactly, winter is ending. It's snowing. Wendy smiled. And really, what am I? She walked into the hallway. Not only was Wendy's size always imposing, but she was carrying 1,000 more bags. As usual, though, she took off her fur coat in winter and put on everything expensive in town to spite her detractors. Then she took out a box. Here's some sort of drawing tablet she bought. The seller said that the kids love it. I promised him that if my goddaughter did not like it, I'll come back. 
and this tablet is quieter. You scared the hell out of me. You must have had the whole Wendy's store thoughtfully stretched out. Well, it's partially true. Oh, you spoil Emily. No, don't start. Who else would I spoil? Wendy picked up her bags and went into the kitchen. Oh, I see you're having a quiche. Are you going to ask? You know I have to have flour to stay in shape. They laughed. How many diets? Wendy has tried it just can't be told. When she was on a diet, even flies were afraid to fly by. The result was always the same. No matter how much Wendy lost, then she gained even more plus. But there was only one person who ruined her relationship with everyone. Her husband was able to convince Wendy that she was beautiful just the way she was. Wendy began to put out the presents. Meat, sour cream, cheese, milk. When the table was already piled high, she pulled out a jar, as she knew it. These are the products of our new production. What is it? What do you mean, what is it? The village is honey. You didn't have bees. Why not? But you never talked about them. What's there to talk about? Bees are like bees. They fly and buzz and make money. Oh, Wendy. What's the big deal, Wendy? Is it bad to have a lot of money? It's very good. If it wasn't for Wendy, we wouldn't have 15 jobs in this neck of the woods. What, you already have 15 people working for you? Camille's eyes widened. Yeah, but that's permanent. And then there's the seasonal ones. Well, you're a feudal lord, Camille, I wanted to add something, but I heard something from the room. Emily's voice was mama, and she went to her daughter, and Wendy followed her. Oh, Aunt Wendy, what kind of aunt am I? How many times do I have to tell you? Wendy sat down and hugged Emily. What are you doing? Are you sick? I have an idea. That's what happened. It's no big deal. Listen, Emily, I wanted to ask you something. Are there any tablets now that you can draw on? Yeah, I know. It's pretty cool. There's only one in our backyard that has one. And you wish you had one. I wish you had one. But it's expensive. I draw with it. Wendy gestured like a magician and pulled out a clipboard. Emily's eyes were so wide that her friends laughed. Emily seemed to be feeling fine. Or maybe the clipboard had that effect on her? In any case, Camille took her temperature and called Wendy into the kitchen. The girl didn't seem to notice that they had left. She was so absorbed in studying her new toy. Camille put the kettle on, took out the cake. Wendy squinted her eyes. Is it your friend who decided to get the same shape as me? And the cake and the quiche. Camille laughed. No, I'm not going to be that pretty anyway. Come on, tell me about it. Why did you come unannounced? Wendy looked at her mysteriously. I have to go to the hospital for some tests. Camille looked intently at her friend. She wanted to think happy thoughts, but it was embarrassing to ask. She knew how worried Wendy was, because she had not been able to get pregnant for three years. Still she asked Wendy, you look like that, that's what I think. And Wendy jumped up. Swirled around the kitchen, yes. Camille exhaled, finally. Congratulations. Mason knows. No, I won't say anything until the doctor tells me I'm not wrong, that everything is fine. Oh honey, I'm so happy for you. He's going to have a heart attack at the news. My friend laughed happily. He'll get over it. He is a strong man. Camille hit a grin. Mason, Wendy's husband was a very clever man. In fact, he was a real man. Well, the thing is, when Camille, and not just Camille, first saw him, she was a little shocked. Mason was almost half a head shorter than Wendy, and the size of him. He was what they called wiry, not an ounce of fat, skinny, lean. Next to Wendy, he looked like a teenager, but that was only a first impression. After spending time with him, Camille understood the first. Mason has a steely disposition, and you can feel it right away. The second is that his whole character is gone. When he's around Wendy, he just loses his mind. He looks at Wendy like he's a hypnotist. He'll never fall out of love, and he'll do anything to make sure his sweetheart has a good life. The friends sat in the kitchen and talked for a long time. From time to time they dropped in on Emily, but the girl had no time for them, begging her mother's phone. Emily was calling her girlfriends and sharing the news, not just sharing, but describing all the benefits of a cool tablet. Wendy came back from her room and sat down at the table. 
I'm sorry, Camille, but Emily, the older she gets, the more she looks like John. Yes, I know. Don't you think I see it? There's still nothing from him. Camille shook her head. No, and I don't want to see him at all. Wendy looked at her friend carefully and sighed. You are a fool, Camille. It's not his fault he was born into the wrong family. It wasn't his fault he was born into the wrong family, so let him. Let him. He loved you so much. Wendy, let's drop the subject. I don't want to see where he is or what's wrong with him at all. Camille lied a little bit she wasn't just interested. She even tried several times to look for John through social networks, through his friends on a page that had been abandoned years ago, but she didn't find anything. Concluded that he had gotten married or moved away or something. I tried to forget, and though I convinced myself that I hated the man, I understood that it was not so. Well, if you don't want to, let's not dwell on the past. I think there'll be nothing left but charcoal and a charlotte in five minutes. Camille jumped up and rushed to the stove. Oh my goodness, it was you, Wendy. It's always like that when you sit down with me. Wendy laughed merrily. Emily came over. She wanted to know what was going on in the kitchen. Climbed into Wendy's lap, snuggled up there, and soon fell asleep. Wendy carefully moved her to the couch, covered her with a blanket, kissed her cheek Camille, who was watching all this, whispered that you will be a great mother. And her friend suddenly asked seriously, do you really think so? Really, I'll go make the bed and you and me. They lay there for another two hours talking softly, remembering things from their school years. Camille talked about who she had seen from her classmates, who got married, who got divorced, who was born. Then when he said everything, Camille, tomorrow we'll talk. I am very sleepy. Come on, Wendy, good night. Wendy quickly fell asleep, and Camille, she couldn't sleep. That's why they remembered John. Now she's tossing and turning again until morning, remembering. They had met at work. Camille was busy, bringing some reports to the computer. John came to see her boss. He looked cool, of course. It was obvious right away that the young man was no mere mortal, but Camille was no surprise. She had seen more than that in her time at the firm. William wasn't here and wouldn't be today. He is tired right in front of her. What are we going to do about it? Camille raised her eyes at him in surprise. I don't know what you will do with it. Young lady, what is your name? Camille frowned. Actually, she had a Namtek hanging on her chest. What does it matter? The young man squinted and suddenly laughed. Camille? No way. Are you serious? There are names like that now. Camille blushed all through school. She endured the ridicule. Then it got easier. And now there's something wrong again. You have a strange reaction to a common name. The man suppressed a laugh within himself. I'm sorry, it's out of surprise honestly. I meant no offense. Personally, Camille stopped paying attention to you. He didn't say anything more either. He just said goodbye and walked out. The working day was over in 30 minutes. You could relax a little, because now nobody else was coming. Camille leaned back in her chair. How nice was that? Tomorrow is the day off. I could get a good night's sleep. The young man's laughter left a slightly unpleasant residue, but she decided he didn't deserve her upset. Half an hour later, she turned off the computer, threw on her raincoat, and hopped out of the office. Just as she came to a stop, a jeep pulled up to her. The window rolled down, and Camille saw the same young man. Camille, excuse me, let me give you a ride. Camille saw her bus pull up to the bus stop. She shook her head and stepped toward the bus. John, it was him. I couldn't believe my eyes. The other one would have thrown herself on the hood just to get in the car with him. This one chose the bus. But no, he wouldn't let that happen. The bus drove right past him. He could clearly see the Camille girl looking at him and smiling. John felt a kind of excitement in his chest. All right, so be it. He followed the bus. At every stop, he stopped with the bus and watched to see if the same Camille came out. How carefully he looked, how hard he tried. But he got as far as the park, and the girl never came out. Or rather, she must have come out, but he missed her. John slammed the steering wheel in annoyance and then laughed. She'd seen him coming, so she must have been confused on purpose. But Camille got off the bus. Thank you. You're welcome. Run along now. Camille lived just outside the park. 
All the drivers already knew her and never tried to drop her off. If Camille walked through the park itself rather than around it, she was just in front of her yard. She walked and smiled mentally. She could see perfectly well that the young man was following her. For some reason it seemed to Camille that he was to be feared. He did not behave himself very well, but he did not arouse any negative emotions. She did not regret running away from him. Why would she need these passing acquaintances, especially with such people? Camille always walked to work in the mornings. Such a walk was invigorating, it helped her wake up. The weather wasn't great today, but Camille decided not to change her rules. As soon as she turned to the office, she saw a familiar car. The girl slowed down, frowning. Now that kind of interest was getting weird. Then she relaxed. What Camille thought of herself, he'd just come to see her boss. Camille walked determinedly toward the entrance, but didn't make it much further. The car door opened. Camille, she stopped, sighed, and turned around. William should be on time today. Camille William is not that important to me today. I'm much more interested in you now. I'd like to take you out tonight. We'll listen to music. We'll drink some real Italian wine. John wanted to continue, especially since the standard set of phrases worked without fail. But Camille interrupted him. You don't have to try not to go on. I don't accept the invitation. She turned around and went into the office, and John was left standing there with his mouth open. Something he didn't understand just now. What was it? No girl? Maybe this Camille just doesn't know who he is. He got into the car and slammed at the door with force. One interesting thought crossed his mind. What if it was luck and really didn't care that he came from such a family? That his daddy had a lot of money. No, there just aren't any in today's world. Or is there? He never figured it out, only completely confused. Camilla peered cautiously through the glass door and immediately recoiled. There it was. Standing, waiting for her, but no. And she had no intention of speaking to him again. The girl resolutely turned around and went out through the back door around the building. She looked out. The car was standing sideways to her, and she could clearly see the man looking at the entrance. There's the bus. She walked briskly toward the bus. John never saw her when the guards closed the door. John grinned. Well, Camille confused him a second time. Why? It's very interesting. It's interesting to get someone who doesn't need you at all. Camille, on the other hand, decided that people like John wouldn't play for long, so she could settle down. But she was wrong this morning. As soon as she got to work, she immediately saw John. He was coming out from her boss. He left a card on her desk, an invitation card to the concert. Camille opened it and froze. It was her favorite band. No, she wasn't going. But how could she not, since the only people she'd been listening to lately would be singing there? For the rest of the day she kept thinking, kept agonizing over whether or not to go, Wendu decided. She called, and in a crazy voice she yelled Camille. They're only in our town with concerts for three days. I know you're going to be mad at me, you'll hate me, but they gave me one ticket at work, and I'll go. Even if you never talk to me after that. Camille listened to her friend with a smile. Wendy was in her repertoire. Smoke, sparks, hoof stomping. Wendy, speak. I'm ready to hear it all from you. Wendy, I'm going to the concert too. I was invited by a young man who invited you, well, a young man. You didn't tell me you had a boyfriend. I don't have one. He just invited me. I didn't understand anything. But since you're going, we're going to be friends. Camille couldn't hold back any longer. She laughed you seriously thought I wouldn't talk to you if you went to the concert. I wouldn't have forgiven you. Oh, Wendy, you're being silly. Well, of course I would. At the bottom of the card there was a number, or rather a handwritten number. Camille dialed it. Yes, there was no doubt. That voice belonged to the very young man. I cannot refuse your invitation. I couldn't, even if I wanted to. I am very glad you accepted. I'm very fond of this band myself, but I tell you right away after the concert I'm going home." The voice in the tube was so naturally surprised that Camille believed him. Did you have any other plans? I have an early flight tomorrow. I was also going home after the concert. Camille blushed thickly and then smiled, revengeful. John hung up. One. Two. Camille, strange as it may seem, 
The evening passed away. John was getting ready for some rustic attire, but Camille looked pretty good. The clothes may not have been very expensive, but they were so well chosen that Camille looked chic. In addition, when she was not showing off, she was a beautiful girl, for whom any activity for fun. Somewhere in the middle of the evening they met Camille's girlfriend in the crowd. At first, John was upset, but then he remembered that he wasn't going to seduce Camille for tonight anyway, so he watched the two of them. He thought Camille was funny, but no. Her friend was crazy and they climbed up high and sang along from there. But he couldn't stay away like an almost gentleman. He climbed up to them. It was the mast that began to crunch and break. Camille smashed Wendy's knee with her hand, and John took on two girls, one of whom was pretty good, weighing in. Wendy rushed one way and John, grabbing Camille's arm in the other, he saw the guards running toward them. And he also saw, finally saw, that there was a camera on top of the mast from which the concert was apparently being filmed. They stopped just inside the park, collapsed on a bench, laughing and trying to catch their breath. Camille was already looking at the man with interest. Are you a good runner? He laughed. And you crawl through the matches with a new fit of laughter. Bent them in half. Camille suddenly said the last song you didn't listen to. Don't get upset. Do you want me to get you tickets for tomorrow too? No, that won't be necessary. That would be unnecessary. Why don't we go out for ice cream and juice? Honestly, my throat's dry. After the cafe, we didn't take a long walk. John was not at all what she had first imagined him to be. He knew a lot and skillfully joked. And Camille realized that she was very interested in him. Then he walked her home. Camille, I was very wrong at first. You'll have to forgive me. I'm used to having everything and everything very easily. And then you and you. I'm not interesting at all. You helped me to come down from heaven to earth. And here on earth it turns out, it's not even boring. Camille laughed and looked at her wounds. She did. It's not boring, that's for sure. Maybe we could go somewhere else. If possible, choose something a little quieter. Camille herself didn't know why she agreed. But at that moment she didn't even think about it. She just nodded her head, said do you know how to find me? And she ran off into the entryway, and John smiled. How could he not immediately see that Camille was so extraordinary? Their romance was so beautiful, so tender and romantic, that Camille believed that books about love don't lie. There is real love, and halves exist, too. It couldn't be any other way. And then John proposed to her, and she said yes. My father is expecting us tonight. I'll tell you right off the bat, my relationship with him isn't great, but we try to keep it right. My mother divorced him 10 years ago and then she died. Now we're learning to be a family again. Camille was terribly worried. She prepared herself carefully, put on her best dress for an hour and spent it in front of the mirror. They drove up to a large mansion. Camille's heart was pounding terribly, but she calmed herself down. This mansion could have been sold a hundred times already. What was she so worried about? They walked in, and Camille saw the man she hated so much that she dreamed about him. It was Noah. It was you. He was looking at her too. John looked at Camille and then at his father in surprise. Do you two know each other? Camille grinned. Know each other more than that. Your father ruined my parents. Right on my birthday. But thanks to his money, he turned it around. So they were the ones to blame for their death, not your drunken daddy. He also told me to walk around and look around. How's that for familiarity? Camille. But I didn't know. And I don't care. I hope you understand that I can never have anything in common with your family." She turned and ran out into the street. Camille didn't know whether John was running after her or not. She was running away, so only the wind was whistling in her ears. John tried to talk to her. He would meet her after work, follow her, tell her that he had left his father, that he didn't want anything from him, but only her. But Camille didn't listen to him. Then one day she saw a program on television. Camille watched it often, and that day she sat down on the couch, too. It always showed very convoluted crimes. That day, when she saw the splash screen, Camille became numb. She turned up the volume. It was about her parents, Noah about what really happened. She never understood what really happened. But Noah was gone from their town.
John was gone too. He never came back, never said anything, never persuaded her. Camille breathed a sigh of relief, but not for long. It wasn't long before she realized she was pregnant. What was going on in her soul at that moment? Was she carrying a grandchild or granddaughter of the man who had ruined her parents, and the joy that she would no longer be alone? There was no question of terminating the pregnancy, she had never even considered doing so. And then Wendy, when she found out that Camille was pregnant with John, she said what if you hadn't told me? But I liked John, he didn't choose who he was going to have, and the baby had good genes. He wasn't a drunk and he wasn't stupid, also quite good looking. Camille smiled sadly, yes he is. You forgot to add that he is very charming. We shall grow up. We did. And they did. And they made a hell of a girl. In the morning, Emily woke up before everyone else. Camille crept quietly out of the room to make breakfast, and then she saw a glow under Emily's blanket. Emily she called her that when she wanted to be tougher. A heavy sigh was heard from under the covers, and Emily slowly looked out to see what was up. Emily pulled out a clipboard. Camille sighed so. There is a time for sleep, for sleeping. Sleep restores the body's strength, especially in girls who are sick. Mom, I get it. I really hope so, because otherwise I'll have to give you the tablet by the hour. Emily sighed heavily again, and then looked slyly at her mother. And now, since I've already been reprimanded, can I keep drawing? Camille jumped out of the bedroom to keep from laughing. How do you talk to her? Wendy came back in the afternoon. She looked a little confused. Camille even thought the pregnancy wasn't confirmed. Wendy, what did they tell you? Wendy looked at her with a detached look and then smiled at Camille. You won't believe it, Mason will go crazy because I already have. Wendy, are you frightening me? Camille, we're going to have twins. Camille was silent for a while, digesting the information, and then she hugged her friend. You are Wendy in everything. Everything is a mess, but always the best. Camille, I don't know how to break it to him, just like that, just like that. Well, you make him so happy. Wendy grabbed the phone and ran into the kitchen. She was back in about 15 minutes. She looked even more confused now than when she came in. But now what? Camille was beginning to think Wendy's husband wasn't happy about the addition. Mason, what's not to be happy about? Glad what very glad. Then what happened, Wendy? He cried. When Wendy said that, Camille herself almost cried. It was so. She couldn't find the words. It was so good, so sweet. Three hours later the doorbell rang. Camille went to answer it. It was strange. She wasn't expecting anyone. She looked out the peephole, smiled, and opened the door. There was a bouquet on the threshold. That's what you could call it Mason, because the bouquet took up all the space of almost a meter and a half of roses. How many were there? Camille wouldn't even say roughly, because she had never seen so many. Camille pointed her finger toward the door of the room with a smile. Mason smiled back and moved over there. Or rather, the flowers did, because Mason couldn't see out of them. Anyway, Mason drove his Wendy away noisily, with hugs and kisses. Camille and Emily were alone. Emily put away her clipboard. Mom, is Aunt Wendy going to have babies? Yeah, two at a time, that's a good thing. I wish I had a brother or sister, I'd have fun too. But it doesn't happen that often. Camille saw that Emily wanted to ask another question. Sweetie, is there something else you wanted to ask? Yes, mother. I've got a couple more kids from kindergarten. No, dad. Why not? Camille was confused. That was a question she certainly hadn't expected. Or rather, she knew her daughter would ask it someday, but not at the age of six and a half. Well, it happens that people love each other, and then something happens, and they break up. What about you? Did you break up with my dad too? I'm sorry, there was nothing to do. I just had to nod. And he's not at all interested in me, Emily. He doesn't know about you. You left before. Even I didn't know then that I was going to have you. And where he is, I don't know. I probably would have told him about you now Camille was lying. She would never let that family communicate with Emily. The girl thought a little more, then picked up her clipboard. Camille sighed in relief, hoping the question was over. But it wasn't. Mom, do you think if Dad knew about me, would he love me? 
No, of course, how could he not love you? Now Emily smiled and sighed contentedly. Camille hurried into the kitchen. What a conversation. Emily was drawing Papa. She had no idea what her daddy looked like, but she understood that he was just like other daddies. Only her daddy was a hundred times better. He's kind, he's smart, he likes to walk in the park and feed the ducks. He also likes to make up new hairstyles for dolls. Someday he will be found for sure, and Emily will tell him how long I've been waiting for you. The girl was so dreamy, she didn't notice how she fell asleep. Camille looked in on her, asleep. Time is still short, of course, but she was awake at lunchtime. The woman didn't bother her, just covered her with plate in the kitchen. The phone must have been ringing, Wendy sending her happy pictures. She was very fond of teasing Camille. She would send a picture of them barbecuing or herself in a wreath of wild flowers. Camille promised me she would come soon, but she kept missing one or the other. But she had to get out and see how landlady Wendy was living and breathing. Camille washed the dishes and cleaned up. There's not much time yet. You can lie down, flip through the tape on the phone. In general, she was not a big fan of social networks, but sometimes she could browse the news. Immediately you become aware of everything, who got married, who is looking again, who had someone born or who bought what car. She had just laid down when she got a social media message. Hi, what are you doing? Camille let out a long sigh. It was David. He had been working at their firm for about six months. By the way, William said he was very hands-on and would go far. And he'd been trying to woo Camille for six months. David was a handsome man, too handsome. Camille would even say a sweet woman never liked them. So David only had to sigh. True, he himself never approached her openly. He was secretive, putting a chocolate bar on her table, or a flower, or sitting with his eyes fixed on her. He asked her out a couple of times, but Camille refused. There was nothing to do, there was no interesting news. So Camille said, hi, I'm not doing anything. David immediately started to write a message and Camille got comfortable. At least that would pass the time. Camille, I have liked you for a long time, but you know that. I would like to come and visit you and meet your daughter and you. I can see that you are against me. Really, I don't know why. It's not like I've done anything wrong to you. Camille, it was embarrassing. It's not nice, of course. Though on the other hand, he hadn't said anything openly to her. He had only said it the first time, or rather written it. Camille thought about it. She had been alone for so long. And not even because she was afraid for Emily. Rarely do strange men treat their stepdaughters well. That was exactly what she wasn't afraid of. Because the first wrong look thrown in her Emily's direction would have ended the whole relationship right away. She just didn't seem to care and time was running out. She too wants to be someone's wife, to be loved. Meet them after work, bring them coffee in bed. And why not David? He makes good money, calm, handsome. She didn't notice him getting into hard liquor or anything. All in all, a positive man, and what if it all works out? Yeah, I don't like him very much. Well, that's all right. Maybe he's a good man and things will gradually fall into place. No, David, it's just that I didn't think you really liked me. Let's get together, like tomorrow. No, I can't tomorrow. My daughter got sick, and there was a pause. Camille already thought that David had just decided, since no means no. But soon she got the message, so ask someone to sit with her or let her be alone. She's not a little girl anymore. Camille was offended by his words. I'm sorry, good night. She watched as David sent her angry smiley faces and angry hearts for another 15 minutes. And she thought about the fact that she didn't like him very much. Here the heart is not deceived in the head. Just then a nasty voice said deceive, how you deceive. And what about John? And then Camille thought, for the first time since she had broken up with John, that when he was right. It wasn't his fault he was born into that family. But that was just one way of looking at it, and the other with the other. More than seven years passed, he never once appeared with that thought. Camille and fell asleep. Sunday morning came, and it was time to decide. Were they going on sick leave, or would it still be enough to ask for a couple of days off? I decided that it would be better to ask for sick leave, because there were no urgent deals yet. I mean, they'll give me five days sick leave. That's a week she's wasted. 
Her boss had no problem letting her go. The boss let her go without a problem. And the last thing he said was grow up. I got a call from your clients and they're happy as hell. Thank you, William. You taught me everything. Well, don't exaggerate and you're no fool yourself. Camille understood. She heard her praise and smiled. In general, she was very lucky with her boss. Sometimes he treated her as if he were her father. Camille hung up the phone, went into the room with her daughter Emily. You and I rest for two more days, but the daughter wasn't in her room. Camille looked in her room, also empty. She turned and saw the front door open and her daughter's jacket missing. Yes, she was out of her mind, she just had a fever. And she ran outside. It wasn't like Emily at all. She would never leave in her life. Just like that, without warning her mother. Camille looked out the window and aghast, ran across the yard to the garbage cans. There sat a homeless man. From afar it was clear how cold he was. Her daughter was dragging her thick, shaggy plate in her arms. Camille was still in her room slippers, and she ran after her. What was she doing? To hell with the plate. What if this man hurt her daughter? Camille dashed out into the street and ran after her daughter. Emily. But Emily was already beside that man. She gently covered him, and he mumbled blue lips. Thank you very much, girl. When Camille ran up the bum shrank back, frightened, and gripped the plaid tighter. Camille was about to tell him off. You can see you're not old. Why not go to work? Emily, hurry home. I'll talk to you later. Mama, he'll freeze, but you'll freeze too. Don't forget you're sick. What's all this anyway? Running away without saying a word. What if he had hurt you? Emily was beginning to cry. She could see that her mother was very angry. But for what? She just wanted to help the man. The girl turned and staggered back toward the house. And Camille finally turned to the bum, turned around and shut up. She became as pale as chalk. Then, in some unnatural voice, she said, and the bum looked at her guiltily. If you want, I'll go away, if I disturb you. His eyes were kind and friendly and vacant. John, what are you doing here? I'm sorry, but my name is Jacob. He was tired, and Camille didn't understand anything. She took his not quite clean hand, pulled back his index finger, and looked at the tattoo. There was a little heart there, it was the same as hers but somehow John didn't recognize her. And anyway, how could he be on the street in the first place? She frantically tried to figure out what to do. It was clear that she could not let John or Jacob go in such a state. Would you like to eat? A very man smiled like a child. I don't get served well for some reason. They all send me to work. That's how I work. I'm not working for myself. I'm to the bosses. Camille realized that John was being pushed around by beggars. Only one thing she did not understand was what he was doing on the street, what he son of a millionaire was even doing here. Come with me. The homeless man looked at her frightened. And this is convenient, convenient. Let's go Camille walked briskly toward the entrance. The homeless man followed her. It seemed to the woman that all the neighbors were looking at her from all the windows at the same time. To hell with them. She would say that she had found her father's old things and decided to give them to the bum. No one saw him leave, that's all. Maybe it was left in the attic altogether. She might not know. So let them all think what they want. John stared. He wrinkled his forehead, looking at the pictures, on the wall, at Camille himself. It was as if his mind was in shambles. And Camille couldn't understand if he really didn't remember anything for some reason. Or he'd forgotten because he'd been drinking. She immediately reminded herself that even though the man was a bum, it didn't look like he was drinking. Would you like to take a bath? The bum came to life, can I? Well, sure, go ahead and find everything there. She quickly went to a closet somewhere on two shelves. There's some of her father's things downstairs. There's no way she could have thrown them out. This was mom's front compartment, so to speak. Not that there was any ceremonial clothes in there. And that's where she would put the new things. Then they migrated higher up to the things dad wore. Camille pulled out a tracksuit. She froze for a moment. Daddy kept meaning to exercise, that is, run in the mornings, as many people he knew did, but kept putting it off and meaning to start next Monday never started. Well, here was a suit his mother had to make for him. Moreover, he wore the suit he bought and then sighed that he had to start running only in a new one. 
here, it should fit you. While John was in the bathroom, Camille got a call from Wendy, a friend. What should I do? She briefly outlined the situation, and Wendy sighed for a long time, then in a normal voice said to make an appointment with some doctor, which one and how to make an appointment. He obviously doesn't have any paperwork, so do not panic. Now I'm going to call my mom. Lately she's been really into treating anything she might have. She'll know exactly what to do. Camille had just talked to her friend when the bathroom door opened and John appeared on the doorstep. It was like I was born again. Come into the kitchen and I'll feed you. Emily watched the whole thing from her room. It's one thing to help someone, but it's another to bring home a stranger and someone so strange. Then Emily decided her mother must know what she was doing and went out into the kitchen. Especially, frankly, she really liked this bum. His eyes were so smart and kind, and he had a nice smile. She wants to smile back too. Emily, you will eat. Yes, mama. The man looked at the girl. Thank you very much. I'm more used to children throwing stones. Emily was surprised how rocks. That hurt. Why? Well, there are some kids who do something, but they don't know why. Emily shook her head. I'm not like that. No, you're not. The man laughed. I can see that. You're a smart girl, a serious girl. Camille put the plates in front of them and sat down with a mug of coffee. Tell me, Jacob, do you remember anything from your past life? He shook his head. No, so why remember it? Obviously, it was the same as it is now. I know so many people from the street. They've always lived like that. Well, you're wrong. A lot of people got on the street by accident. Really, for some reason I don't think so. Not everybody likes to talk about it. He shrugged. I remember me a long time ago. I mean, I don't remember when I was young young, but I'm in my sixth winter on the street, and that's a lifetime. So I doubt I'm a former millionaire. She looked at him and thought that now John was very close to the truth. As ridiculous as it sounded to him. Don't you feel like remembering anything? I don't know. I used to. I even went to the police a couple of times. The first time they told me no one was looking for me. The second time, they sent me away real quick. They even broke a couple of ribs. You know, it's not good to be outside with broken ribs. That's why I didn't go to them anymore. Besides, if they were looking for me, they probably would have found me. And if they weren't looking for me, then no one needed me. Emily sniffed her nose. That's not how it works. Someone always needs someone. It's just that the person who needs you is lost somewhere. What if he needs your help? Don't you want to remember anything? John looked at her confused. The thought had never occurred to him. Camille hit a grin. There you go. Her daughter says all the right things. And John suddenly said I don't understand. I look at your daughter and I realize that I've seen her before. It's like she reminds me of someone. Camille sighed if you only knew who in her pocket the phone rang. Of course, it was Wendy. Write down the address, my friend. Wow, you have news. It's definitely him. You can't be wrong. Mom says it's just money. You pay and you don't need any information. No, it happens, doesn't it? By the way, don't worry about the money. I'll give it to you. Wendy spoke so fast. Camille could hardly understand her. Wendy, that's it, that's it. Write down the address. We'll come to you tomorrow. Hold on there Camille smiled. It felt like Camille had to be rescued. Wendy and Mason are like Chip and Dale. She wrote down the address, the phone number. Not a minute later, a text message came in about enrollment. Camille shook her head. Oh, that Wendy. The man gently pushed the plate away. Thank you very much. I guess I must be going. I've overstayed my welcome. You're not going anywhere. We'll go to the hospital tomorrow. He looked at her in confusion. What for? I haven't got any documents. Don't you really want to remember anything? You just reminded me of someone. I want to make sure you're not a good person, or maybe he's a bad person, and then you'll bury me somewhere. Camille smiled. Good, good. Camille understood that he had to be kept overnight. But no matter what you say, his mind was in the dark. But she didn't want to let him go outside. The woman looked out the window. Two homeless men found something in the dumpster and wiggled. They dragged the something, but something must have gone wrong. They argued, and then they started fighting. They were both drunk, 
Camille grimaced. No, she didn't. She made John a couch in the big room and went to the small room with her daughter. Before she went to sleep, she put a chair under her arm. Emily was surprised. Mommy, what is that for? But we don't know Jacob. What if he does? She saw her daughter's eyes widen with fear and hurried to say what if he is a sleepwalker. Do you remember how you came to the kitchen and you sleep? Emily laughed merrily. I remember you were so scared at the time, but I don't want us to be. Emily snuggled up to her. Mommy, are you so good to me? Well, I don't know, really, this Jacob is good, I can see it, he just got sick and forgot everything. You will help him, won't you? I'll try. In the morning, they were all woken up by the doorbell. The time was seven o'clock in the morning. Camille jumped out into the hallway. Who was there so early in the morning? Mason was standing on the doorstep. Camille, how are you? I'm all right. What's the matter, Mason? He looked at her worriedly. Mason, Wendy, and Wendy are fine. Where's your John? In the room. Why? Camille, you need to pack up and come with me now. Where? I'll tell you everything on the way. Emily flew out of the room and hung on to Mason. Oh, hi, sweetheart. Hi, sweetheart. I'm right behind you. You're coming to visit me. I will, I will. And your mother, your mother? And your guest, too. Camille did not understand anything. But she knew that Mason was a serious and very sensible man, unlike Wendy. So she didn't argue. I just asked for how long? Hopefully for a couple of days. And then we'll see. They all got into the car with Mason. John took the closer look. It's a beautiful interior. Mason took a quick look at it. Do you like it? Yes, very much. They drove in silence. Camille finally couldn't take it anymore. Mason, explain something. Camille, tell me when did John disappear? Did you do any research on him? No, I didn't need to at the time. You should have. I was surfing the net yesterday and I found a lot of interesting things. John was accused of trying to kill his father and John was missing. Then there was a lot of writing about running away. Most of that information was from his father. You see, when the fuss started, it turned out that John was not Noah's own son. Even Noah himself was shocked, and he left right away. The search slowly began to fade. But in those days, there were those who didn't believe John was capable of such a thing. And they blamed my father. They said he had set the whole thing up to deprive his son of money and they found out later that he was not his son. Anyway, John is still wanted, and his daddy's living peacefully in the next town. Do you think he'd be happy if he knew John was alive? It seems to me that the appearance of a son, though not by blood, but by blood. Officially, he would not be happy at all. Besides, John can obviously shed light on what happened when this very attempt was made. Innocent people suffered, and if John is found, or rather, if he is found, then there are two options. Will he go to jail at once, or will his father be proved guilty? Now figure out what to do. All this, of course, only if he remembered something, their heads were spinning. What a detective. And she thought John had just resigned himself to running away. She looked at John. He was sitting there frowning. Surely he had heard the whole conversation, understood what was being said about him. Only he didn't understand anything else. He didn't want to go to jail. And for that, he had to remember everything. His head ached terribly. It always did when he got nervous, especially if he tried to remember everything. They drove up to the big house. Camille said, surprised, I thought you had another one. Mason grinned, you should visit more often. John looked at the house with admiration too. Wendy jumped out of the gate. I was so looking forward to it. They hugged each other and went inside. Camille turned to Mason. Mason, I don't understand. What do we do now? Now we think. They sat down at the table. In a second, Wendy set everything up as if it were a holiday. Mason spoke up Jacob. Can I call you John though? The man nodded. He didn't care what they called him anymore. Anyway, I think you should stay here. Camille and her daughter can stay here and go away, so no one will suspect a thing and we'll try to see a doctor. Wendy, my mother was very complimentary about him. Yeah, okay. What do you say? Thank you, that's all. What if I really wanted to send my father to kingdom come? 
There was silence at the table. And then Emily took his hand. You couldn't, you're good. Everyone just kind of relaxed. And Camille looked at John and realized more and more that here he was. He wouldn't recognize her, and no one would say whether he would recognize her. That same day, Mason took John to the hospital. They did not arrive until the evening. He said he would call back tomorrow, and they were doing tests on him. Camille sighed and Wendy smiled. Everything is going to be all right. I know it will. Everyone was waiting for the doctor to call. But when he did, there was a real panic. Finally, everyone sat around Mason. As he spoke, the housemates tried to catch every word. Mason hung up. It was no big deal. John had a trauma once. Perhaps he experienced some kind of intense shock along with her. Apparently, that's what triggered his brain to block out everything he saw and knew. He said no surgical intervention was necessary. We need to try a therapist, but not the fact that it will help. The fact is that people with this kind of memory loss may never remember anything or may remember everything in an instant. It can happen at any time. Well, or not happen. Camille clutched her head. I mean, John could always be like this without a past. Mason nodded. And Wendy suddenly said maybe it's for the best. After all, you can start all over again. John looked at her. As an option? Only now I still want to know what really happened. A day later Camille and Emily in the hall were getting ready to leave. They all went outside. John was depressed. He had already realized that he had something with Camille. He liked her madly, but he tried not to show it. Who was he? A bum from the dump. And he might be a criminal too. And she's so beautiful and smart, and Emily is wonderful. They stood at the gate and talked. Mason said let's go. Camille looked around. Where is Emily? She was just here. Camille saw her a minute ago. Wendy said maybe she forgot something. She looked at the door, and at that moment, there was a heartbreaking scream. A girl and a big dog barking. Jesus, it was the neighbor's Rex. Wendy went pale. John swung over the fence in a second. Camille ran along the fence, Wendy and Mason followed. The neighbor's gate was open. Apparently, he had gone somewhere. And in the yard, a huge dog stood in front of Emily with one snap of his teeth. Camille wanted to scream, but in the same second, John swooped down on the dog like a kite. Emily rushed to run. Camille picked her up and carried her out of the yard. Mason rushed to John's rescue. Somehow the two of them fought off the dog and with a clamor. They slammed the gate. John had blood all over his hands and head. Mason looked at him as he was alarmed that John was smiling all bitten up, but smiling. I'm fine. I didn't mean to nail my father. I just wanted to talk to him. But he decided to get rid of me. Do you remember everything? Mason looked at him dumbfounded. Absolutely everything. And so was Camille. Mason, can I ask you a question? Yes, Emily. Can't you see for yourself? She's your copy. John almost got burned. Mason, I have to go into town without them. Let them stay with you one more day. Is there someone who can help you? Yeah, he's reliable. Besides, I've got money in the safe deposit box. I don't have any paperwork. Just a question. Just an answer. Let's not say anything to the women yet. Mason smiled, and he liked that one, John. Good. Especially since you'll probably have to get some stitches. Camille and Emily stayed. Even though Camille asked to go with them, little help was needed in the hospital. But Mason was adamant. Do you think the doctor can't do the stitches without you? But Camille, let us do it ourselves. Camille didn't understand what had happened, why she couldn't go with them. And anyway, why do they have to stay here another day? They would have to go to work again. The look in John's eyes still bothered her. Not like he had hours ago more mature or something. The navy and kindness was gone. But then Camille decided that a dog bite was not a mosquito bite. What kind of look should he have? As the men drove away, Wendy was somehow pensive. Camille looked at her. Did anything seem strange to you? What do you mean? About John? Did you notice the look in his eyes too? That's just it. Something our men are up to. What do you mean? I didn't remember. I didn't remember. And then, just like that, he had an epiphany. For some reason I don't believe in such miracles. Camille sighed. I guess you're right. 
they spent the whole day waiting. But by evening, the men had not returned. Wendy kept calling Mason's number, but no one answered. Finally, when they were on the verge of hysterics, Mason called himself. Did you miss Mason? Where are you? I'm going crazy. Mason's voice was funny, and that pissed Wendy off even more. You don't have to freak out. You know it's not healthy in your condition. Mason, you come here, and I'll kill you. I promise you that. He laughed. Don't, Wendy. You and I have a wedding to witness. Just don't say anything to Camille. Set the table for real. I don't understand the table. Oh, Wendy, you'll find out in a minute. We'll be there in half an hour. For half an hour, Wendy ran around like a robot. Camille tried to get some information from her, but Wendy just shrugged it off. I don't know anything. I'm sorry, I had to put up with it. Wendy's like that. If she doesn't want to say anything, she won't say anything. Not half an hour later, a car stopped under the window. Camille jerked toward the door, but Wendy stopped her. Too much honor. They'll come themselves. She should have picked up the phone. The door opened and men piled into the room. John was holding a huge bouquet, and he himself was unrecognizable. Fancy clothes, fancy haircut. Camille was staring at him with her eyes wide open. Mason had five or six bottles of champagne in his hands. Camille slowly lowered herself onto the couch. Alas, so she was right. John remembered everything. Well, hello, Camille. He took a step toward her, and Camille felt the tears run down her cheeks. Hello, John. He held out the bouquet to her and said a few years ago I proposed to you. It still stands. Marry me. Nothing has changed. I love you very much, even more than before because we are now connected by Emily. Don't get me wrong, Emily. She became family to me right away. Before I even knew she was mine. Daddy. Everyone turned around. Emily was long asleep. But with all the emotion, no one thought to keep their voices down. The girl was awakened by the voices. She had been standing there since the beginning of John's speech. He immediately stepped toward her. Emily, yes, I will try to explain to you why I haven't been around for so long, but I will try to be the best father to you. Emily threw herself at him. Don't. Mom said you just didn't know. You would have found me for sure. John threw a grateful glance at Camille, who was already sobbing profusely. Wendy tried to comfort her, but her own tears were flowing. Mason took the initiative. Come on, stop crying. Let's go get some champagne. Wendy. I got you a non-alcoholic. Wendy smiled at Mason. Do you know how much I love you? He hesitated. I don't. Getting a kick in the ribs from Wendy, he said immediately, but I'm guessing. At the table, John said I want to drink to all of you. If it wasn't for you, I'd be rotting in a dumpster with no idea who I am. But most of all, thank you to mine. Daughter, and the kindest and best person. After a while Wendy said well, now tell me. John looked at me with his hands. There wasn't much to tell. So I went to my father to get him to do the right thing. That is, to confess what he had done. He said no, so I promised him I would tell him everything. He laughed and didn't believe me. And when I did, I was just beaten up by my father's dogs and thrown into the woods, hoping I wouldn't wake up. But I did wake up. I even made it to town. I didn't remember anything though. By the way, the news that I'm not a native. His son was started by him too. My friend, whom I went to see today, is already on the case. The father was arrested. Now there's going to be a long trial. And I'm John again. He turned to Camille. Camille, you still haven't answered my question. Camille smiled. But you already know the answer. Why do you ask? It's been seven months. John, where are you almost there? And indeed in the courtyard of the maternity hospital wrapped the car from the window cheerfully dangling. Aloon's 50 pieces no less. Mason nervously moved from foot to foot at the entrance. John kissed his wife and daughter and opened the trunk. How was the cheerful pink stroller for twins? Camille smiled sweetly. It was me or the stroller. Both. Camille laughed. The door opened and a nurse brought out two pink rolls. Mason rushed forward. Daddy, daddy, those words sounded so strange. And Mason felt it. He really, Daddy Wendy was so happy, her eyes shining with happiness. Mason kissed her. Thank you, sweetheart. 
After a feast of presenting gifts of congratulations, Camille, John, and Emily drove home. Emily immediately fell asleep in the back seat. John said in a low voice, The trial yesterday was for nothing. Refused to raise that case. No, let it be. I don't want to rake up the past. Long for him. Seven years she sighed to nail such a little man, who wanted to send his own child to the other world. John noticed that she was getting sad. Okay, let's not talk about the bad things. Camille suddenly smiled, let's not. Besides, I have news for you. He looked at her carefully. What is it? Well, you see, Camille, tell me, don't drag it out, because I don't know what to think anymore. John, I'm pregnant. He stopped the car so abruptly that Camille looked at him frightened. He's not happy. John jumped out of the car and approached her on the passenger side. Open the door. Say that again. I'm pregnant. Camille looked at him and didn't understand anything. He suddenly buried his head in her neck, in Camille's hair. Camille, you don't know what it means to me that I love you. I love you. I love everyone. Emily woke up in the back seat, heard her father's words, turned around, and went back to sleep. It's no big deal. Daddy confesses his love to mom. He does it all the time. The car drove off quietly. Night was falling outside. John would drive so that not a single bump would disturb his beloved wife, his daughter, and the as yet unknown who had settled in Camille's belly.